Welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is a movement of reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense Establishment who believe that strong national security priorities and staunch Zionism are necessary for Israel to be the eternal homeland of the Jewish people. Thank you to all of our viewers and all of our supporters for tuning into these war briefings. It is very important to us at IDSF that you have the opportunity to hear directly from the source, experts on the ground here in Israel who know what is going on and can share their opinions and analysis with you in these very direct and candid briefings. If you have any questions during this briefing, please, of course, feel free to enter them into the chat. We are joined today by Brigadier General Amir Avivi, as well as the IDF spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus. Jonathan is also uh, the person who directs all of the international media efforts for IDSF when he's not on reserve duty. So it's great to have Jonathan, of course, with us right now. General, we'll start with you. What can you tell us about the progress of this war in Gaza right now? Well, uh, as you all know, at the moment uh, in Gaza, uh, we're concentrated on the process of uh, taking control of the northern part of the Gaza Strip. A few, a few days ago already, we uh, really managed to circulate all of the Gaza City. And now uh, the IDF is operating inside uh, the Gaza City, closing more and more on the really centers of gravity uh, inside. We have managed to destroy several uh, strongholds uh, inside Gaza City of uh, Hamas. And we see every day that goes by that uh, the, the way the IDF is operating on the ground and in coordination with the air and the Navy is getting better and better all the time, very well coordinated. And uh, if uh, at the beginning of uh, the ground the incursion, we saw Hamas able to launch uh, almost attacks on the level of a company, 40, 50 uh, terrorists attacking. Uh, we see that uh, their effectiveness is uh, less and less. They're less able to launch really massive attacks and uh, the IDF is uh, managing to cope uh, uh, better and better. We, we are exposing huge amounts of uh, rocket launchers in schools in, uh, in uh, mosques, um, maps, uh, anti-tank missiles uh, that are left uh, over. Um, the combat engineers doing a very good job dealing with the underground uh, tunnels and managing to really destroy this infrastructure as the IDF is uh, moving uh, forward. I, I must say, and probably Jonathan will elaborate about it more, that uh, in this war, unlike previous operations, what is really going on exactly on the ground, it's kept uh, really uh, quiet and um, we're not releasing photos. And also because there is no internet now in Gaza, also the Hamas is, has a huge difficulty to try and uh, send pictures of uh, what's going on. So, um, this is something we're not seeing the way we saw uh, before. In the north, as we expected, uh, Hezbollah is getting, uh, as the ground incursion is uh, is growing, uh, Hezbollah is shooting more and more. We had yesterday 30 rockets, today 20 rockets, and also areas that are already in the vicinity of the city of uh, Haifa. Uh, the IDF is responding, attacking uh, fiercely any uh, attack from Hezbollah. Hezbollah has quite a lot of casualties by now. Um, while uh, the Northern uh, Command is really uh, in high alert and ready in, in Judea and Samaria, um, there is all the time offensive and the uh, arrests of uh, terrorists, uh, I think almost 1,400 by now, uh, many of them Hamas operatives. They managed to uh, launch really one or two, three terror attacks, uh, even one in Jerusalem that resulted with the uh, uh, one uh, so, uh, border patrol uh, soldier, female, that was uh, killed. Ola uh, Hadasha from the Saad Kibbutz uh, in the surroundings of Gaza. Um, but overall, 
the basic strategic situation has remained the same. We're on the defense along all the borders and Judean Samaria and inside and on offensive in the Gaza Strip. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has a big mission and challenge to keep international legitimacy, to let the army, give the army the time to do the job. Uh, he continuously talks with Presidents Biden and Blinken and uh, other leaders in the, in the West and keeps uh, the legitimacy we need to continue and uh, operate and uh, develop this uh, war. Uh, and the Minister of Defense, Gallant, is all focused on one thing, destroying, destroying and destroying. All of Hamas uh, capabilities, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and uh, all the infrastructure inside Gaza. Um, and as I said, it's going well. And uh, let's hear, uh, you know, who is actually really in the details, Jonathan. Thank you, General. Yes, please, please, Jonathan. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you, General. Uh, and uh, shalom to everyone listening. Uh, a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to be back with, uh, with the IDSF. Uh, since Saturday night, evening, uh, a month ago, I've been in uh, reserve duty. Um, my last assignment in the IDF, I was the international spokesperson up until... Uh, 2021, basically Ju July 2021, and since then I've been a private citizen. But once the attack started, uh, I immediately uh, informed the IDF spokesperson unit that I was ready to go. Actually, uh, I went and did a few interviews on my own before going into uh, uniform. And ever since then, I've been doing night shifts. Why night shifts? Because one of the main takeaways that I had from my tenure, four years being a spokesperson and 11 days during uh, Operation uh, Guardian of the Walls in uh, May 2021, was that I didn't have a backup. Now the spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht, uh, has one. Uh, he has a, a few of the uh, former. Uh, we are there and we are supporting and it's a team effort. And I've been uh, doing uh, night shifts in order to allow the regular team uh, to sleep or at least get a few hours of sleep during the night. Um, that is why I've been doing less for the IDSF because I've been focused really on uh, uh, presenting the IDF to the world. Uh, I'd be happy to share about my experiences, uh, what's, uh, go what's been going on. I'll just compliment what uh, uh, General Avivi said about the current situation. We are operating in all of the all of the areas around Gaza Strip, and yes, we are intentionally keeping that vague and unclear. Uh, we don't want to give the enemy a clear understanding of the presence and location of our troops. Definitely not the plan ahead. But once we attack on the ground and after we attack, then we speak about it and then we release information. Uh, but, uh, but learning from past events. We are careful about uh, sharing our locations and we don't want to give away anything to the enemy. So far that tactic is good because we understand that he is uh, on his toes and keeps on guessing and doesn't really understand despite the fact that it's such a media saturated environment. Hamas is still having difficulties uh, uh, really focusing its efforts. Now we are extremely careful uh, not to feel complacent and not to feel too good about the combat efforts. We know that we are fighting a ruthless, vile enemy that has had time and availability and effort uh, to prepare the battlefield and to prepare lots of underground infrastructure, tunnels, and they have significant military capabilities in terms of anti-tank missiles and rockets, RPGs, and other types of weapons that they have. In each engagement that we get to, let's say, a battalion compound, an enemy battalion compound, we expose subterranean infrastructure, we blow it up. Just a few hours ago, we released additional footage of additional tunnels that we exposed, cleared, and now blew up. Um, it's dozens of feet below the ground, and they, uh, it's really uh, significant infrastructure, and we also uh, expose a lot of weapons. 
weapons that Hamas has been able to stockpile coming in through the tunnels from uh, uh, through Egypt, most of it. Uh, and uh, some of the weapons that we find are uh, really high level standard weapons. Um, the morale in the IDF is high, despite the fact that there are we have sustained casualties over the uh, week and a half that we've been maneuvering inside Gaza. Uh, despite that, morale is high, cohesion is high. Our troops on the ground, regular and reserve, are very clear about the mission, very clear about what needs to be done. And there's very little noise in terms of the mission how important it is, and most importantly, the link between what the troops are doing on the ground now and how that relates to preventing another October 7. People understand that if we don't take out each and every Hamas stronghold under Gaza, whether it is underneath Jabalia or Shati or Zaytun or many other neighborhoods, doesn't matter where they are, wherever they are, the IDF understands that if we don't take them out there, then we will face additional challenges and they'll be able to regroup and challenge us again. And that is a situation that the IDF understands perfectly clear. We are not going to allow uh, at the end of this war. Uh, so I have uh, the, the troops on the ground are working methodically, systematically, without rushing and without exposing themselves to undue threat and danger. We're using lots and lots of additional fire capabilities from the air, from the sea. We're using lots of intelligence in support of the tactical movement of troops in order to expose our troops to the least amount of danger. They are in a very challenging tactical environment. And so far, the troops are, you know, it's war is a learning contest between two sides where you the price that you pay is in blood. Our troops are engaging with the enemy, learning and uh, constantly improving and operating better, safer, faster and uh, pushing back the enemy. They are under duress, Hamas, but we have to be very careful not to be uh, complacent or, or to let down the guard even for half a second because they have significant infrastructure. And in some locations, they are fighting and they're fighting quite hard. We have exposed how Hamas uses the civilians as their human shields. And this is a major uh, thing theme that the IDF spokesperson unit under the leadership of Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, whom I know that you have seen on the daily updates in Hebrew and in English. This is, by the way, the first time in a long, long time that the main, the chief IDF spokesperson addresses the world in English, usually uh, the, spoke, the chief spokesperson speaks in Hebrew, and then the uh, international spokesperson, my previous job, does the English. But this spokesperson, I think, is doing something very important and addressing the world as well. Um, and uh, what, uh, what we're doing is exposing the, the, the foul and immoral practices of Hamas using hospitals, mosques, UN facilities, uh, schools, infirmaries, ambulances, and all of the uh, uh, despicable practices of Hamas on the battlefield. We're exposing that, uh, including Qatari uh, involvement and the hospital that they, the Qatari hospital that we just uh, exposed, and uh, many other things. Um, I'll say that we all understand in the IDF that this is going to be a long and difficult endeavor. Nobody is... Uh, and nobody harbors any ideas or any thoughts that this is going to be a quick, clean fix. We understand that this is a significant endeavor. It will take time. We will sustain casualties, but the mission is very clear. And the IDF uh, reserves and regular are focused. There's high morale. There is unit cohesion. Beautiful things of all of Israel coming together setting silly political differences aside, casting those aside. All of the things that uh, plagued Israeli society for many months, that is a thing of the past. And what we are now focused on as one effort and one uh, fist is to defeat Hamas. And as General uh, Avivi is, said, we are also very vigilant up in the north. We understand that Hamas is one enemy with certain military capabilities, but that Hezbollah in the north is 
by orders of magnitude larger than Hamas in terms of firepower, quality of personnel, and weapons, and that we are uh, we have to be very ready for that area to escalate as well. Last word before I uh, speak about before uh, uh, Moshe will direct uh, questions. Uh, very important international involvement. Uh, the quick response of the U.S. and the military posture. I'm not going to get into politics and 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 things that are less, you know, military for me to be speaking about uh, at the national level. But I will say that the cooperation between us and U.S. Central Command is outstanding. We share intelligence. We share assessments of the situation. And I think that what our enemies are seeing is basically one front of Israeli and U.S. assets in the area and with a clear posture towards Hezbollah, towards Iran, towards the Houthis and anybody else who is part of the Iranian axis of evil, uh, that there is cohesion, resolve and capabilities uh, to prevent a regional war uh, and for this stage to allow the IDF to focus on Gaza uh, in order to get the job done first and foremost in Gaza and then we'll see what we will deal with uh, uh, other uh, fronts as well. Uh, so Brother, other... can you explain to people how, how this unit works? I mean, you guys have to deal with all the the world and, and you know interviews and uh, and and digital and all of that. How is how is it done? Yeah. So what we're doing is we see ourselves as enablers. Uh, the what we what we establish what we aspire to enable is for the IDF to continue to operate and to have legitimacy and international support for our activities. Um, and, and that is the essentially the job of that this part of the IDF spokesperson unit. Now, the IDF spokesperson unit is a large unit in the IDF, which is deployed on the ground in all of the maneuver divisions. And it has three target audiences. First and foremost, the Israeli audience. The domestic audience, because the IDF is the people's army, and first and foremost, the IDF spokesperson unit is uh, provides answers and reports to the people of the state of Israel. Right? We have to be uh, make make sure that Israelis understand and that there is transparent flow of information. And I think that uh, you you can see the briefings being done by Admiral Hagari from day one, even when the situation was horrible. Uh, absolutely appalling on the first days of the of the war after the atrocities of uh, October 7th, daily briefing, transparency, and telling the Israeli public what's going on, what's happening, answering questions, and providing a clear address of uh, authority and responsibility to the Israeli public. Then we have the Arabic language spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel Av uh, Avichai Adrai, and the people who work under him who are targeted and focused on Arabic speaking. So the people in Gaza, Hamas leadership, and of course, all of the enemies around, he addresses them directly. If you don't know of him yet, you should know he is phenomenal. He is on a totally different level of communicating and does tremendous strategic work by delivering messages in clear, perfect Arabic to enemy leaders, to civilians in enemy areas, both to deter and to dismantle and to demoralize and many other things. And of course, to inform people around the world speaking Arabic, what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. Now to the international, which I am part of. I am not in charge. I'm in support of, uh, uh, of the current uh, uh, spokesperson. Uh, we're a bunch of uh, reserve officers. Now there are four of the previous Lieutenant colonels who were in the job over the last 10 years, we are now all working together in a concentrated effort, just like all rest of Israeli society is coming together and working. We're doing the same. Our task is to engage with Western media. Uh, we operate in English, Spanish, French, Russian, German, uh, and a bit in Persian as well. But these are the five main languages, and we do it all across uh, uh, the entire media landscape. So we do uh, mainstream media, old school mainstream media, television, uh, broadcast, uh, uh, radio, podcast, and of course, print, uh, newspapers. 
Uh, we do all of the social media. So all of the official accounts of the IDF, the Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all of that. Uh, we have a website which we run uh, and, uh, and is uh, updated almost minute by minute. And all of that is constantly pushing out. Now, to give you some, you know, an indication of the scope of the uh, uh, operations, there's more than 1,500 uh, foreign journalists that have come to Israel since the war started in order to cover the events. And all of those, of course, want content from the IDF. They want to interview personnel. They want to get access to our troops on the ground, and they want to get briefings and uh, uh, and content. Uh, and the IDF spokesperson unit handles that in cooperation with different government uh, entities, the GPO, the government press office, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, other ministries, and we are working together. I want to share with you that, you know, I was the spokesperson for four years international. Uh, my experiences then differ from the situation today. I see today a system that works much better, that is much better geared Toward the, towards the international audience that is actually working and spending uh, energy, time, and resources in tailoring content towards the international audience, towards generating international support and fighting uh, delegitimization of Israel, fighting fake news that Hamas disseminates, uh, and, uh, and and many other things that uh, we we uh, are part of, and I'm happy to say to see positive uh, changes in that under the current leadership. Um, let's let's say a few words about the men and women who are who are in this unit uh, in peacetime in regular time. It's about 50, 60 people, but now massive uh, inflow of people, reservists coming in, many people. Uh, are you know have their lives abroad working in the US and working in other locations everybody automatically came back and are uh, uh, volunteering for service uh, to do whatever they can in order to get the message out yes it is an extremely challenging media environment and uh, no we are not winning uh, we're not winning yet and there are many many challenging outlets Editors, journalists, and of course, the online battle in social media is extremely challenging, but I can assure you that the IDF is fighting, is fighting, is producing content, is taking the initiative, is doing creative things uh, on social media and with uh, mainstream media, and it is a fight that is extremely important for the IDF, I think for the state of Israel, in many cases, the personnel of the IDF spokesperson unit they speak uh, on behalf, not only on behalf of the IDF, but on behalf of really of the state of Israel, even though our business is military, but many times we are perceived as uh, representatives of the state of Israel. Uh, that's just how uh, the, the, the necessity. Uh, and uh, we understand that it's a long fight that we will have to do, uh, but I am uh, encouraged by the current situation, by the awareness inside the IDF of how important it is to deal with and cater to the needs of the international media so that we can continue uh, to support the operations on the ground and explain to the world what it is we're doing, why we're doing what they're doing, and face all of the many countless attempts to uh, uh, slander the state of Israel, to demoralize or to question the morality of the IDF in fighting. I want to be very clear. I know of no other military that does what the IDF is doing now and has done so far when it comes to getting civilians out of the battlefield and employing and actually enforcing the rules of uh, armed conflict and or the laws of armed conflict and humanitarian law. Uh, and therefore, I am able to confront whomever attacks and questions our morality uh, me and the uh, other spokespeople were able to do that, looking into the camera, telling people, no, you're wrong. What the IDF is doing is 100% justified. Even if the numbers are challenging and the footage coming out of Gaza is unpleasant and sorry to see, but at the end of the day, this is the responsibility of Hamas. We are doing whatever is possible in order to minimize the effect on civilians. Uh, and we are totally at ease with our moral uh, 
uh, efforts to minimize the uh, threat to uh, civilians and non-combatants. Um, and, and we are out saying that, knowing fully well that this is the reality on the ground. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Many, many, many questions are coming in. You've piqued many uh, curiosities for all of our viewers. We only have a few minutes left. So let me let me start with one question, and we're clearly not going to get to most of them. You have many, many years of experience with the international media. What would you say the current temperature is, so to speak, in the international media, in, in supportive of Israel, less supportive of Israel than years past? What What is your feeling on, on the ground of how we're being perceived? Yeah, you know, the first day uh, before we declared war, but on October 7th, I went to, uh, did a few interviews and I tweeted, remember how this started. On, uh, on, uh, on October uh, 7, I tweeted, remember how this started. It started with an unprovoked and unprecedented attack against Israel. Uh, and now we are going to respond against it. I also spoke something about the Iranian uh, uh, axis of evil. That tweet is very relevant and I intend to retweet it periodically because we know how things start and then we know the kind of, uh, of rhythm that uh, the international media in general has. It started with a lot of outrage and support for Israel because of the tremendous, unprecedented brutality and attacks against Israeli civilians, the massacres, butchery, and I won't go into all of the, the, the graphics again, uh, because everybody watching for sure are aware. Uh, and then that was the coverage. Now we are in the stage where most of the coverage is critical of Israeli efforts. We are working hard to remind international media and international legislators and people of influence, remember where they started. It started with the biggest and, uh, and an unprovoked attack against Israel. That is why we're doing what we're doing now. Uh, and that is why this needs to be done. And don't lecture us on morals and don't lecture us on proportionality, because if we don't get the job done now, this will return again. Uh, I can say that it is challenging. I can say that the news cycles are focused and driven by visuals coming out of Gaza and that there appears to be an, almost an endless litany, an endless stream of self-appointed experts from various organizations and institutions around the world, NGOs, UN, and many other institutions that are, um, how should we say this, taking the opportunity in order to uh, uh, challenge Israel's right to defend itself, in order to challenge our uh, ability to, to do what we need to do, despite the fact that everybody saw what happened on uh, October the 7th. And in many networks, uh, the media coverage is challenging, the narrative is challenging, the uh, experts that are brought in, so-called experts that are brought in, are uh, some of them are outright hostile towards Israel, some of them are very biased, some are fair uh, and uh, impartial, uh, but today it is an uphill struggle and uh, uh, it, it, it is a, a challenge to get our message out and for, for them to listen. Because unfortunately, what people are swayed by are uh, visuals of rubble in Gaza. And so many lack the moral and professional clarity and courage to look beyond the pictures. And I understand on a human level to see children, bodies of children being dragged out of rubble in Gaza that, that that's moving it's sad to see and, and 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 it's not what we intend to do at all but so many people don't have the ability the moral or intellectual ability to see okay why is this happening and who is to blame for it and why is the situation as it is in gaza and how could it be different and the knee-jerk response is blame israel and that is what we are fighting trying to uh, uh, explain and make that clear that this isn't our doing, that responsibility is with Hamas. Um, so that is going on. There are many outlets that I think uh, should be doing a lot of soul searching and reckoning, uh, you know, propagating fake news, 
the hospital incident in El Ahli uh, in uh, for two weeks ago when Hamas spread fake news alleging that we bombed the hospital in Gaza. It took us a few hours, but then we got the truth out and uh, major news were in networks, BBC, uh, CNN for some times, um, the New York Times, Washington Post, they all took statements made by Hamas, plastered them, blasted them on their uh, home pages and uh, the headlines, 500 killed in Israeli strike on hospital. Based on what? Based on what Hamas says, on nothing else. And then when we pushed back, and it took us a few hours of hard fighting when we pushed back in the media. Many institutions, BBC and New York Times, were uh, forced to admit that they did not deliver, that they uh, acted uh, on a subpar professional level and reflected uh, a false narrative. And that is something that I've never seen uh, the mighty New York Times or the BBC actually issue clarifications, which is uh, a washed uh, term for uh, for an apology. Uh, so we are holding media accountable. We are explaining what we do. We are communicating transparently. We are answering questions from the international media, but we are also holding them responsible for their coverage. And I think that the El Ahli incident is really a proof of the responsibility that international media has to report events on the ground factually, and not you not be fooled by by Hamas and 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 uh, and uh, ignite protests and clashes all around the Middle East and the world. Uh, but there is a lot of work to do. Uh, if you're asking about where to where you can see our see the information, I see a few of the questions popping up. The IDF homepage is IDF, not to be confused with IDSF. Both are outstanding and excellent, but uh, IDF. Uh, dot il forward slash en that's the idf uh, homepage daily updates and all of the content and then of course twitter facebook uh youtube and all of the other uh, content that is uh, uh, is available we'll share lieutenant colonel jonathan conriquez thank you so much for joining us we are out of time i don't know if general avivi is still on the call and can give us yeah a... i'm uh, here moshe but on the, my way to the tv station um... Can you give us a final a final message for the day before we close up? Uh, you know, maybe I, maybe you know, give uh, Jonathan a question or two. Uh, I'm sure people, you know, had a lot of questions. Maybe choose a question or two to for Jonathan to answer. All right, Jonathan, we'll give you the the final question, the final question, and maybe we'll twist your arm to come back again. Of course, um, I'd any, be more than happy to. No arm um, twisting maybe, needed. I'd be honored and happy to come back. Amazing. So many of our viewers themselves are, are battling anti-Semitism in their own communities, are writing to, to their own local newspapers, communicating with their own policy uh, makers. What advice, what strategy can you provide in terms of how to deal with these media outlets? Is it about defending claims? Is it about emotions? What's what's the what's the pitch you can give us? Yeah, we, we've been uh, uh... Talking, I've been talking and my, my peers, my colleagues, we've been doing lots of webinars for Hillel students on campuses, for different organizations in, uh, in the US and in Europe of Jews that are coming together and, and, and really facing horrible uh, crime and pressure and violence and bullying both online and in the real world. Um, what we are saying uh, is, and, I, and this goes back, you know, even though now I'm in uniform and I represent the IDF, I think it connects also to with what Amir and the movement have been talking about for so uh, for so long. First and foremost, it is about the fighting spirit. It is about belief in the justness of our cause. That is the fundamental thing. And I think this is something that has been eroding over the last years where people have been tainted by anti-Israeli anti propaganda and where the strength of our conviction has been eroded by lots of false information. And the first and most important thing to solidify is our belief in our right to exist here, in our ancestral homeland, to defend ourselves, to build prosperous, peaceful communities, to live in respect here 
respect our neighbors, but to live first and foremost in respect within ourselves um, and, and, and to demand from anybody around us, enemies and uh, uh, friends alike, to respect our right to live in our ancestral homeland and not to be apologetic about the fact that we live here and that we want to prosper and uh, do the amazing things that we do. The second thing is to keep attacking, keep dominating. Don't wait for your adversaries, to the for the masses of anti-Semites and anti-Israelis and bigots and evil people to demonstrate on the streets and take the initiative and, and control the narrative. Don't wait for that to happen. Take the initiative. Be out, do active things, whether it's writing letters, writing op-eds, holding uh, elected officials accountable, being active on social media, or applying pressure on academic institutions, on legal institutions, on government bodies, basically taking the initiative and not waiting for the enemy or the adversary or the supporters of the enemy to take the initiative and dominate, but getting out there and holding people accountable. Because I think that at the end of the day, this is such a clear moral situation. If there are people out on the streets waving with Palestinian flags and chanting slogans like from the river to the sea, they are on the wrong side of morals and they are on the wrong side of history and they need to be called out for supporting genocidal terrorist organizations. Nothing less than that. And people that are on our side should be strong, should be aggressive, should take hold people accountable and should be shaming people that are supporting Hamas. And I'm not saying supporting Palestinians, supporting Hamas. Those people should be ashamed of themselves and they should face consequences for supporting terrorists. And who will make them face consequences? People like uh, that are here on this webinar by focusing on it, by applying pressure, by calling them out, by naming names, and by applying pressure on politicians and, and elected officials. But I come back to the underlying enabler. It is the spirit and our belief, our conviction, and our knowledge that we are fighting the most just of battles. That is what we're doing. We are defending our homeland. And anybody who doesn't like it can go, to, can go somewhere else. We are totally within our rights to defend ourselves. That is our moral obligation. No other military would do it differently. I think other militaries would, would perhaps use more firepower with less distinction, less proportionality. But because we are Jews, we are humane, we are moral, we are doing what we're doing uh, with, with less firepower than what we have. Uh, but that shouldn't be confused and that shouldn't, shouldn't undermine our right to do what we're doing and to get the job done uh, against the evil terrorists that we are fighting. And I want to send the last final message of strength. I know that Amir and the officers in the movement are doing a tremendous job in Israel, speaking about cohesion and showing cohesion, activi activities on the ground, strengthening Israeli society, coming together, which is beautiful. Uh, and I can say that what I see inside the IDF is of a strong, united, cohesive IDF where political nonsense is cast aside. We have a mission. We're focusing on the mission and we do not let outside past noise uh, uh, influence the resolve and our ability to fight. I am confident that we will fight. We will win. And I would like to end with just saying Am Israel Chai. And I would like to thank you for having me on the webinar. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank, thank you, you, General Avivi. We're going to end here. Thank you to all of our viewers, all of our participants, and Jonathan, amazing work that you're doing, and we look forward to having you back. Take care, everyone.